Hello, Noir Mystery fans. My name is Jess, and this is Cam Cat Unwrapped. You've been listening to Thunder Road by Colin Holmes, and today we have the author with us here for a virtual interview. Colin, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. So Gabe and I were talking a little bit before the interview, and we thought it would be really fun because you have just that really nice Southern gentleman voice. If you could do your (laughs) own interview, introduction, like how I just did, hello, my name is Jess and this is Cam Cat Unwrapped. If you could do your own just so that we could hear that lovely voice of yours. (laughs) Hello, and welcome to Camcat Unwrapped. <laughs> what else do I need to say? <laughs> That's great. If you want to, I mean, this is a perfect segue into you doing your own introduction. If you want to do your your best Jim Beam voice as you do your own introduction. <laughs> <laughs> um, what can I tell you? I'm, uh, I'm Colin Holmes. I'm the communications and creative director for a large multinational electronics company during during my waking hours. Um, I'm a native Texan. I was born in Amarillo and have lived just west of Fort Worth for about the last 25 years. Um, been married to a very patient wife for 30 <laughs> years, and she's a wonderful person and keeps me going on these things. Um, I'm also really involved in the writing community here in Dallas and Fort Worth. Uh, I'm the director of the 2022 DFW Writers Conference. I'm going to plug that. It's coming up in October, so uh, hopefully folks can come do that. Um, beyond that, I'm a long-suffering Texas Rangers baseball fan. <laughs> uh, done, yeah, we're, we're never going to win the World Series. Um, and then as a... Uh, uh, as an older male Texan, I'm required to be into barbecue and fun <laughs> things like that. Well, those are fun things. I think, yes, as an older male Texan, maybe that is something that people would expect you to be into. But who isn't into those things? Um, you mentioned well, the, uh, yeah. the DFW Writers Conference. That's so cool. So you have a lot of different ways in which you incorporate writing into your everyday life. Mm-hmm. I do. I'm, um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of what I do in my day job is is writing. We write everything from uh, from tweets and uh, uh, commercials, lots of social media work, uh, lots of email campaigns, fun things like that. And then uh, to get away from that, I write uh, all the fiction I can come up with. That's right. Yeah. And that's why we're here to talk about your book, Thunder Road. So what's your connection? I mean, noir mystery, that's a really fun one. What's your connection to that genre? Well, I I started out as a, uh, I transitioned from advertising into wanting to be a screenwriter. Uh, and there's a story about that. Maybe we can get to later. But uh, one of the things I did was went to, went to UCLA and took their uh, writer's program uh, went through that entire curriculum, and it's basically film school. How do you write a story for film? And one of the things that you do is study old movies uh, and those black and white noir films like The Maltese Falcon and Double Indemnity and Sunset Boulevard and The Third Man, all of those great old books that became wonderful movies uh, just kind of hooked me on the genre. It's uh, You had beautiful black and white photography and great stories, but it were always inventive characters and interesting situations. And that's what, uh, that's what I like more than anything were the, uh, were the characters, the, sure. the Sam Spades and the, the thin man and all those guys. Oh, that's so neat. So it sounds like you got to really view writing through that movie lens, which is really interesting. I feel like that's so clear in this book specifically a, because of the the content, but also because it is noir mystery. You can see it playing out so clearly black and white in your head as you're reading. That's so fun. That's so cool that you were able to use that to inform, you know, your genre fiction writing. Well, and, and I've, I've read Norma novels, you know, Dashiell Hammett, Mickey Spillane, Ch- Raymond Chandler, all those guys. Um, and just 
there's there's something about the language and the feel of the period because most of those are set in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s sure. and uh, you know the, even the ones even the ones that are new and uh, you look at uh, like Blade Runner which is really a noir detective story but it's set in the whatever future and uh, and still has that same feel of the genre so right. uh, I just I just like those guys who get out there and you know, kick over the ant hills and see what uh, what's not supposed to be what's not supposed to be seen in the light of day, <laughs> and uh, and find it out just because they think that somebody ought to know about it. Sure, yeah, that's so fun, and that I think is definitely what Jefferson Sharp kind of got up to. We were able to really see a day in the life of someone living in the 1940s, and there was a lot going on. You know, you talk about the Roswell incident. Las Vegas, the CIA, all of these big things were happening. And obviously we get to see them through a very different lens in your book than maybe what it was like in the actual 1940s. But what was your fascination with this time period? Is it all of these events that were kind of going on then? It's, uh, it came about because I was, I, I, it wasn't anything I was like, oh, I need to write a noir novel and, and I'll do this and this. I had uh, I'd read an article or seen a news story or something, and, and it clicked that some of these things all happened in this one summer. You had Bugsy Siegel getting murdered, and you had the Roswell crash and incident, and then you had uh, President Truman spinning the, uh, the Air Force off from the Army and uh, at the same time creating the CIA. And I'm like, like what, if, what if these things were all related? What if they're all connected? And then what if the most unusual person could figure that out what if it's a, a cowboy detective in fort worth <laughs> who uh, has no reason to be digging on this but just kind of pulls the thread and unravels the entire mystery so that was a really big summer you were saying all of these things were going on Ooh, the roswell incident uh, the mafia things happening what kind of research did you have to do to inform all of that i guess i'm kind of asking you for a history check for your book, what kind of things were going on exactly during that time period that made that the '40s so interesting? Well, it was it was a very busy summer. I mean, it was we're we're two years back from World War II, so um, everybody who was gone is suddenly back. And uh, you know, in Fort Worth, there were a lot of things that uh, the city had grown from being a stop on the Chisholm Trail for cattle drives and things like that. And the history there was that when all these cowboys would come into town, they would uh, they would all go to an area of town called Hell's Half Acre, which was brothels and bars and everything, you know, gambling halls. Um, if you happened to see the uh, the uh, Paramount TV series Yellowstone 1883, a lot of that takes place in the Fort Worth. Uh, Hell's Half Acres, and they indeed, they shot it here in Fort Worth down in the stockyards, which still looks a lot like it did 100 years ago in some places. Uh, but this people in Fort Worth, they got tired of that. They cleaned it up. They ran it out of town, and they ran it out to Thunder Thunder Road, and uh, that's where all of those, uh, all of those uh, gambling halls and poker rooms and dance halls all wound up out there. Um, so there was a lot of historical information, the Chamber of Commerce, the local libraries, lots of uh, old newspaper clippings, things like that that uh, went through. There have been some really good books about it. Um, and Fort Worth's got some, some unique history because you've got all these cowboys. You've also got the aviation industry, which came to town with World War II. And uh, they built a big, a gigantic, at one point it was the largest building in the world uh, to build bomber aircraft for World War II. And wow. uh, that's, that plant still operates today. It's, uh, uh, they now build F-35s in that, uh, that old bomber plant. Um, I married into a family, my wife and my in-laws, they've worked for generations at the aircraft factory. So I've heard stories after stories after stories about the aircraft factory and uh, all up and down Thunder Road and uh, Highway 199. Uh, and so just folding some of those anecdotes 
they became, you know, in some cases, entire chapters where uh, people, things that happened to different people that uh, I'd heard stories and secondhand information on. So the, wow. the research was a little organic more than just going to the going to the library or diving through pages and pages of Google searches, things like that. Sure. Wow, that's so interesting. Well, okay, I was going to ask you what aspects of your personal life informed the characters in the book or the stories of the book. So in any way, is, do you feel like the character of Jefferson Sharp was informed by your life or things that you were going through? Or is it a lot of the stories you've heard from your wife's family? Uh, a lot of it are, are, are some of its stories. A lot of it's just good old fashioned in imagination. Um, things I wish I could do. Um, <laughs> you know, Sharp, Sharp's the, the one defining era of Sharp's life is the, uh, are the years of World War II. And, uh, you know, he's in Europe for four long years, uh, fighting the Germans. And, uh, that doesn't, <laughs> I don't have anything in my experience that relates to that. But, uh, you know, he, he and I share some idiosyncrasies. I think he's, he's a little hard headed. Um, he doesn't necessarily <laughs> know when to quit. He's, he's kind of versatile because when we, when we first meet him, he's, he's a cowboy, but he's not a cowboy. He's been a cop, but the only job he could find when he got back from being, uh, an infantry officer is working as a, as a livestock detective chasing cattle rustlers. Um, <laughs> it's not what he's trained to do, but it's what he can find to do. So they'll do that. I've kind of understand that, uh, variety of life history from, Going advertising and screenwriting and sure. now writing a novel. Yeah, definitely. Both of you seem like jacks of all trades. So that's very cool. I like that you were able to draw on that aspect of yourself to kind of write this character who also has a lot of different, I was going to say fields of interest, but I think what would be more appropriate is skills, just able to do a lot of different things. So that's really neat. Where's... Wears a lot of hats. Sure. Whether it's a cowboy hat or a fedora. <laughs> or, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. Well, you'd mentioned that in Jefferson Sharp, he had, was just coming off of World War II. Obviously, that's something we see a lot of in the book. And a lot of things we've talked about that summer was a really jam-packed summer. Would you be able to give us a little bit of a history check for those of the members of our audience who are like me and maybe know bits and pieces of the stories of what happened back then, but aren't really familiar with the the knowledge and details that you had to kind of go into for your book, but obviously it's a little bit different to fit the fiction genre. So if, or would you be able to give us a little bit of info that you were able to sure. find in your research? Yeah, you know, the uh, the Roswell incident uh, is, is kind of a, a theme through the entire book, and it's nobody really knows or wants to say what happened. Um, I'm not sure I believe that it's little green men, but it makes for a great story. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, and, and, and some of the things that I've got in the book are actual real historical things. Uh, when the, uh, um, when whatever it was crashed on the ranch in New Mexico, they took it first to the, uh, to the air base there in Roswell. And then they flew all of the wreckage to Fort Worth and so it was the first place that things really came and people actually started to look at it. And there was a famous photo of, uh, um, of an Army Air Force officer uh, with some tinfoil and some sticks and some things like that on the front page of the newspaper in Fort Worth. <laughs> and so I said, well, okay, well, we'll use that. Yeah. Uh, and then about that same time, um, Bugsy Siegel was... Uh, uh, the the people he was building the Flamingo Hotel in Las Vegas decided that he might not be spending all of the money on building the hotel there, and uh, he was uh, he was murdered in Beverly Hills, and uh, then President Truman uh, at the end of the summer signed an executive order, and in that same executive order, he not only spun the Air Force off from the Army where it had been since, I think, Orville Wright had uh, sold him some airplanes. Wow. Um, he then also reinstituted what had been the Office of Strategic Services during World War II and re 
reconstituted that and called it the Central Intelligence Agency. So those things coming together thought like, you know, hey, what if all these were related? What if there was a reason somebody wanted to do this? Sure. And uh, we'll have one guy who figures it out. <laughs> That's so fun that you were able to kind of put all of the these different things together. Because as you said, historically, they all happened so close together. And who knows? Mm -hmm. Maybe they were related. Maybe there's more truth to your book than we all know. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, I have one. Well, I have a few more questions that I really want to get to before we have to start wrapping up. Sure. Uh, but the first one is you've talked about your your experience in the film industry and in the ad industry. So I would love to know, you also had said that this was originally supposed to be a screenplay and uh, it just turned into a novel just because there were so many different concepts and so many pages that you had already written for it. So if you could cast your book with Famous actors or even people in your life. Who would you cast as all these characters? All these characters. I, you, know, you, you, you mentioned this to me early, and so I, I've had some time to think about it. And, <laughs> oh, good. You know, I, you know, I think if if Jefferson Sharp is is from Fort Worth, it's he's got to be played by somebody from Texas. Um, you know, so Matthew McConaughey is probably the uh, the guy who uh, who who would pull that off. But I think. There are a lot of, of, of leading men who have the right jaw for it and uh, that <laughs> kind of thing. You know, you look at uh, John Krasinski or a John Hamm, sure. maybe a Chris Pratt, Chris Evans. You know, if we could, if we, if budget's not a problem, I don't have a, you know, <laughs> I'll go into that. <laughs> yeah, why not? Let's, um, let's shoot for the stars, right? <laughs> sure, sure. And then uh, um, for Veronica, for Ronnie, I think uh, I like. Scarlett Johansson or an Emma Stone. Okay. Uh, my wife thinks that uh, Michelle Dockery, who plays Mary on Downton Abbey, ah. would be the, an interesting, smart cookie to be that person. Yeah. Um, the mobster. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, for the mobster, Doyle Deneker, who... Uh, I'll tell you about Doyle in a second here, but yes. uh, uh, I need somebody who's who can be slick, but also a little threatening, but also sure. a nice host. And I was thinking, you know, Woody Harrelson is uh. now old enough <laughs> and kind of has that uh, that that gravitas, and he's from Texas, so that would that would work really well. That's perfect. That's so um, funny. I feel like I always in my brain associate Woody Harrelson and Matthew McConaughey, but I don't think. I've ever seen them do any projects together. I could be wrong. Uh, I could be very did they wrong. Do True Detective together. I'm trying to remember. Well, if they, they did, then that detective. is a perfect yeah. pairing because that's you're, very appropriate right for the there. genre. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. So Woody Harrelson for Doyle Deneker. And then uh, you know the rest of the folks. Boy, there, there's all sorts of uh, yeah. E. G. Lavelle, the uh, the head of the. Uh, um, of the Stockman's Association, uh, the only person I would even consider is uh, is Barry Corbin, who has been a million cowboy things in this world, and uh, he's he's actually from just west of Fort Worth as well. And, oh, and amazing! I just I'd like him just to have his attitude on there, <laughs> uh, and his voice. He's got a great voice. Oh, that's fantastic! I love to hear that. <laughs> Well, I had a couple of questions that I had wanted to ask you um, before sure. we wrap things up. And I think, let me rack my brain. Well, one of them absolutely was, what are you reading right now? Um, I've got a pretty good reading list right now. I've Ooh. just finished up a, a book. Uh, a friend of mine wrote, uh, his name is Larry Inman, and he's a, uh, he's a former Secret Service agent. And... Uh, his book is called Worst Case Scenario about terrorists hijacking some uh, nuclear weapons. And it's uh, he's got a lot of authenticity there. Um, uh, I'm also finishing up uh, Ailey Martinez's Constance Verity series, which uh, may or may not become a, a motion picture. I'm not sure. Um, he's, he's, he's another buddy. Uh, and hey. then just having listened to... Your interview with uh, James Lindham the other day, um, 
I'm, I'm ordering into a Canyon Deep because oh, amazing. I'm a tremendous Clive. I'm a tremendous Clive Cussler fan, and it sounds like he's picking up that genre and and doing some great things in marine biologist adventures. So, sure, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, that interview was really so. fun. I don't remember exactly what we talked about, but I know that he had all of his marine bio info. But what was really fun for me reading the book is it's based in my hometown, so I got to hear all the little right. snippets of uh, him mentioning places randomly that were so important to me when I was a kid. So. Big advocate, absolutely. Big advocate for Thunder Road as well. You had just mentioned <laughs> that um, your friend has a book that you are enjoying reading that is becoming a movie, which is very cool. Um, you had written something that became a film, which I had forgotten about. I, I did my research on you and looked on your website and you briefly mention it. And then I went to the little link to learn more about it, but I would love for you to share more about it yourself as we're talking <laughs> here and for our audience. <laughs> the, uh, the story behind, uh, edge of the world edge is, of the world. Uh, when I was, uh, um, a, uh, when I was, I was working as a creative director for an advertising agency and we were doing pro bono work for an orphanage. And uh, as we're going around and doing all of our, our our intake work, our discovery sessions with all of the, the people in this orphanage, and I thought, this is just an amazing story. Some this, this is really, this is a movie. Somebody should make this a movie. And I thought, well, why don't I write a movie? I mean, I can sure. write a 60-second commercial. How hard can another 119 minutes be for a movie? Well, it turns out it's really hard. <laughs> and... Uh, I, I worked through a draft and learned the, that there was an awful lot of stuff about uh, filmmaking and screenwriting that uh, I didn't know that I didn't know. And uh, that was one of the things that led me to the, uh, the feature film writing program at UCLA was to try and, and learn that craft. And uh, we, uh, so I went off and, and, and learned how to write a movie. Uh, I went to the orphanage and a foundation that they work with. And I said, you guys, I wrote this movie. You, know, you don't have to do anything with it. We don't have to do anything with it. But I think it'd be a neat thing to put together for your uh, big anniversary that's coming up. And I introduced them to a producer that I knew. And uh, she and they worked and started putting together uh, all the background stuff that you have to do to make a movie. And uh, I said, well, this is going pretty well here. They're going to they're gonna make my movie. This is great. <laughs> and then they said, well, we want to bring in somebody who actually knows what they're doing about writing a movie. So they fired me off my own movie and <laughs> sent me on my way. <laughs> and uh, they, I didn't even know that the film got made, to tell you the truth. I didn't wow. know that the film got produced or had a big premiere or anything. I was just stumbling along looking at, uh, for some other information. And I said, oh, that's interesting. That sounds a lot like a movie. I Wait a minute. <laughs> that is a movie I wrote. Wow. And, uh, so it's been kind of a, that was, and I've, I've taught in learning more about screenwriting, I found that that's not altogether unusual at all, that people will come up with the concept for the movie and then and write the entire the producer movie? will go out. Yeah. And then the producer will go off and say, okay, I have this screenwriter that I've worked with before and I really like that and they'll bring that in. So if you notice on uh, most movies, you'll see that the credits roll and they say written by and then story by and then screenplay by and all this. And it's everybody who, who rewrote everybody else as the movie went through production. Wow. So, so I got did you get credit that for that? I did get credit. I okay. do have a, a very lonely IMDb page <laughs> that says Colin Holmes, one thing, <laughs> but it, uh, it was a great experience. And, um, uh, I, I hope and pray that it worked out the way that the folks at the orphanage wanted it to work out because they've got, uh, it's, uh, it's a little place up in the panhandle of Texas called Boys Ranch, and uh, they do wonderful things for a lot of great kids. Wow, yeah. So even though your name, well, okay, first of all, that is lovely, and I'm not trying to, <laughs> to jump over the fact that there's this lovely orphanage that's doing wonderful things, but I had this right. question on my mind as soon as we started talking about it, and then I was like, sidetracked, lovely orphanage, I am pro-orphanage is doing wonderful things. <laughs> sure. Um, but I was thinking more about the fact that you were in the 
credits of the movie, but never knew that it was made. They don't yeah. notify you or anything. Uh, well, they didn't in this case. Um, now, I don't have an agent for the film, so they probably there's a procedure where they would uh, notify the agent. Uh, I don't have enough screenwriting credit to uh, be in the Writers Guild because I know the Writers Guild then would take care of that. But uh, in my case, it was just kind of a, a early in the career kind of thing and um, just fell through the cracks. <laughs> Interesting. Wow. I know so little about how the whole world works, um, which is funny because my dad does a little bit of stuff in, in the industry. And I'm always surprised what things people get credits for and don't get credits for and, you know, get notified about and just, you know, find out <laughs> later. Like my dad, uh, one of the scenes that he worked on in one of the movies he worked on recently was nominated for an award and a pretty big award for the industry that he's in and his name was on it and he had no idea that his name was on it for this award and I was that's just so wild to me that you wouldn't like someone wouldn't tell you oh hey by the way I submitted your scene mm -hmm. or you know your scene is, is up for review and this whatever and your name is at the bottom that's just so funny to me <laughs> um, yeah. same thing we uh, we apparently the film went to a couple of film festivals and did did, did okay at a couple of film festivals and yeah I'm, <laughs> ignorance is bliss and I'm a happy man <laughs> didn't I know mean, a thing about it <laughs> that's fantastic I'm so glad it's doing well and yeah I guess ignorance is bliss in that you know it it, it worked out you, you didn't need to know about it in order to live this wonderful fulfilling life um and I now obviously you're very good at all of the things in that sort of realm because you're still doing ad writing and and doing things in on that side of production as well so that's very neat um so before we wrap up to shift gears sure. um is there anything that you are currently working on that you can share with us uh any sequels maybe to thunder road anything completely different just anything that you are working on either as far as your writing goes or your ads to keep an eye out for yeah the uh, the big thing i'm working on right now is is the uh, the next installment the sequel to thunder road Woo! um which uh, which finds um ronnie and uh, sharp in las vegas in 1947 <laughs> and so okay. lots of interesting things going on there um so that's uh that's in the planning stages. I'm kind of still, you know, as I say, I'm more pantser than plotter. So I've got a lot of things going different directions as I tell myself the story. But I think I know where it's headed. That's so funny to um, say that. <laughs> oh, Joe Crawford a, said uh, something similar about um, being a pantser or something to that effect when uh, he was yep. on a few weeks ago. That was, that's just a funny little thing. <laughs> It's it's fun to write it from the seat of your pants because the characters <laughs> will take you places that you didn't really anticipate we were going to go. But uh, you say, well, what would they do in this situation? Oh, they do this. Wait a minute. I didn't have anything planned for them doing that. So <laughs> I have to figure out where they're going. Wow. I love that. That's That must be such a fun way to write. Just it is. figuring it, really it out is. as you go and let the characters tell you the story. I'm a big outliner, mm -hmm. not that yeah. I'm a, a writer, but I'm a big outliner myself. So I like to, to have the plan and then to do the thing. But I feel like some of my favorite stories are at least ones that I feel like have these really interesting twists and turns of the ones where the characters take control. And you're not the only one who said that. Yeah. Joe had said something. Someone else had said something, too, about, like, the characters are telling you the story and you're just here for it. You're just writing it out. <laughs> That's so yep. fun. And yet I have I have friends who are, I mean, they have stacks and stacks of index cards that they thumbtack to the wall and they move scenes around and they know that this character arc is going to go way over here to this person. And it's just, I was like, wow, that's way more planning than I can do. <laughs> sure. Well, and the fun thing is I think both methods make for great stories. But it's always so interesting to hear as someone who is the person who makes the plan. It's so interesting for me to hear about someone who does the, all right, well, here's what happens next, because that just makes sense that that was what they would do next. Uh, so that's so fun. And I love, I, 
that that's how you're writing the sequel as well. That feels very appropriate for Jefferson and Ronnie. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing. Wow. Okay. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on and for sharing everything with us that this has been so fun. Thanks for having me. This has been a ball. Yay. Okay, great. Um, Well, um, is there, can we find you on social media? How can we keep up to date with the things that you're doing? Sure. I'm on uh, a social media website. Uh, I'm not as good at social media as uh, I should be, to be honest. Uh, But uh, the website is bycolinhomes.com. And I'm at bycolinhomes on Twitter uh, and uh, Instagram. uh, And then at I think by Colin Holmes also on Facebook. I'm not on Facebook as much as I probably should be either. But uh, yeah, there's those things are all out there and easy to find. Amazing. I think all of us can relate to that or the opposite problem. Either we're on it too much or we're not <laughs> on it enough. So I understand yes. the not being on it en- as much as we probably should to promote ourselves. But thank you so much again for being on. Just thank you. This has been a blast. Well, yes, Colin, thank you so much again for coming on. This is Colin Holmes, the author of Thunder Road. You can find Thunder Road in audiobook, ebook, and print formats on our website, camcatbooks.com. You can listen to Camcat Unwrapped on all major podcast platforms or watch us on our YouTube channel. And make sure you follow us on social media at camcatbooks. Thank you guys so much for tuning in and unwrapping another one of our books to live in with me. My name is Jess, and I'll see you guys next time here on CamCat Unwrapped.